welcome to our webinar series, Coping with COVID. I am Laura Cummings. I'm the Assistant Principal for Student Services at Glenbrook South. We are excited to welcome all of our District 225 families for joining us tonight. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy evening to spend with us. As we get started, a special thanks to our District 225 colleagues that have assisted with this webinar series. Thank you also to Catch, Youth Services, and Family Service Center for working collaborative, collaboratively with us um, to create this webinar. We are grateful for everyone's expertise and partnership as we navigate this unprecedented time. A special shout out to Jen Rudy, who's a GBN staff member working the technology behind the scenes. Thank you, Jen. Uh, next slide. Preparing for school is the second part of a three-part webinar series that we've been hosting. Strategies for Summer was at the beginning of June, and Moving Forward with Meaning will take place later in the fall. In this time of uncertainty, the one thing we do know is that the school year will look and feel extremely different than anything our kids have experienced. It is more important than ever that we take care of our own well-being as well as the well-being of our friends, our family, and our community. We have identified three goals for tonight's webinar. First, how to help build resilience and coping skills. Second, how to engage, connect, and be motivated. And finally, strategies to support students' emotional well-being. Our presentation tonight will be approximately one hour long. After that time, we will answer questions that have been previously submitted or through the Q&A feature tonight. We will try to get to as many questions as we can, but we will primarily be focused on answering questions that are related to our webinar topic tonight. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ketch, who will talk a little bit about their organization, as well as continue with the introduction of our panelists. I am Amy Hertzberg and I'm a District 225 parent and a proud member of Community Action Together for Children's Health, or CATCH. CATCH is a grassroots organization in Northbrook. CATCH provides educational programming, parent support, and resources in collaboration with schools, mental health agencies, and the community at large. We are very excited to continue our partnership with the Glenbrook High Schools this evening, and we welcome you to tonight's event. Tonight, our presenters are Kate Berger with the Youth Services of Glenview and Northbrook, Cody Schraft of Family Service Center, Glenbrook North's Assistant Principal Eric Etherton, Glenbrook North School Psychologist Bridget Buckland, Glenbrook South Assistant Principal Lara Cummings, and Glenbrook South Social Worker David Hartman. Thanks, Amy. I'm Cody Schraft from Family Service Centers, and we want to start with this great statement that Lara found for us to get us started by Dr. Martin Luther King. That's really relevant to where we are all at today. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands of at times of challenge and controversy. So me and my co-presenters will be sharing a range of ideas and strategies with the intentions of helping you and your families feel more confident and competent when standing in the current challenges and controversies of today. Next slide. So I will be discussing strategies to foster resilience within yourselves, your teens, and your families, particularly now as we face the start of a new school year with COVID-19 still around. But before I discuss these strategies, I want to first start talking about what resilience is. This word's been used a lot, especially the last few months as people are talking about coping skills and getting through this era of COVID-19. But sometimes when we use a word in a lot of different ways, the meaning of that word can start to get feel murky and get lost. So resilience is a process of learning and growing in response to adversity. Essentially, bad stuff happens and you evolve while dealing with that bad stuff. And you're going to be able to do that by balancing stability and flexibility through creating consistency despite changes happening. 
um, adapting to those changes to meet new demands and new needs, such as wearing a mask to keep safe, as well as adapting to changes to meet old needs and old demands in new ways, like students needing to continue to learn, but learning through remote learning, virtual learning. I sometimes think of resilience in the sense of a well-trained ship crew. Um, they're well-trained because they have protocols, they have clear expectations about everyone's job duties, and they have consistent communication. All of that's providing that sense of stability. And that stability then allows them to navigate as the storms come through. And after each storm, they're going to be able to learn and better prepare for the next storm. Next slide. So just as important as it is to talk about what something is, it's also important to talk about what it's not. And resiliency is not something you're born with. It's not a matter of you have it or you don't. Everyone is able to develop, strengthen, and apply coping strategies throughout their life. And it's something that's capable of happening where sometimes people have internal attributes or environmental resources that make it a little bit easier like someone's able to better learn math over learning a language. But at the end of the day, everyone's capable of being resilient and demonstrating resilience. It's also not just about positive thinking and getting rid of the negative feelings. You actually want to be able to be okay with being angry and upset when you're faced challenges and remain angry and upset. It's really about managing the intensity of those feelings so you're better able to problem solve and communicate. Which brings me to the idea, idea of stress management, where resilience isn't stress management. However, stress management allows you to be resilient because it allows you to manage the intensity of those feelings. Resilience isn't about bouncing back a swift recovery. Those imply that it's a one-time thing that quickly happens. Resilience is a process that sometimes takes a while with the ups and downs. It's not a one-size-fits-all created in one way. So people experience it in different ways, show it in different ways, um, demonstrate it in different ways. And different doesn't mean wrong. If I'm experiencing resilience in one way, it doesn't mean it's right or wrong compared to your way. Again, everyone's capable of doing it in the way that works best for them. It's not an individual task. We'll talk a lot throughout this webinar about using your social support system. And that's essential and that's a big part of resilience. And finally, it's not just about dealing with it and powering through. Next slide. So it brings us to resilience and COVID-19. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time about why resilience is important right now. Even saying that feels very like Captain Obvious statement, but it is important in the sense that we're together for longer periods of time. And it's not fun times. It's not vacation time. It's time of persistent stress and uncertainty. It's time of having daily routines mixed up or our dynamics have changed. And it's also unfortunately time of a lot of different losses from loss from death to losses of rituals for life milestones. Graduation parties look different. Birthday parties are looking different. And finally, it's constant changes happening on a regular basis, unfortunately. And those changes are internal within families as well as external communities, both small and large worldwide. Next slide. One thing I want to make sure, though, is as we go through these strategies, you understand they can be applied in a lot of different formats of resiliency, a lot of different aspects of your life. So within individual resilience, within yourself, sibship resilience, caregiver resilience, which can come to resilience within relationships with spouses, grandparents, family, friends, anyone you're working with to support your children, other children in your community. And ultimately, the strategies can work towards supporting overall family unit resilience. Next slide. So here's the list of strategies that I'll be looking at. There's lots of other strategies out there. Um, these are the ones we'll be focused on. The way I'll talk about them, we'll talk about in sense of components of the stability, consistency aspect of resilience, as well as the flexibility, adaptability. Um, I will be talking about some communication strategies, but during my section, I'm going to be focusing on the structure and how to support the opportunities for these conversations, or later on, Kate's going to touch more on specifics on what to say when you're talking to your teen. Next slide. So first, we'll 
focus on constructive dialogues. These are conversations that have that goal of more cl clarification and understanding over solutions and fixes. We'll talk about solution and fixes when we talk about collaborative problem solving. But I really encourage you to keep these goals in mind so you enter the conversations and leave the conversations with the right expectations. In that sometimes these conversations do not end everyone's feeling happy and relaxed and comfortable and unicorns and rainbows. It's sometimes still a yucky feeling when you end these conversations, but it's completely okay to still have a sense of anger as long as you focus on, I understand this person's experience, they've been able to share their experience, as well as I've been able to share my experience. And you're able to have these types of experiences and reach those goals when everyone enters the conversation with true freedom to share their thoughts, concerns, and ideas, especially if they reflect a different perspective than your own. So as a reminder, these conversations are not about who's right or wrong, who, who's better than. It's about understanding and getting each other's perspectives. During that time, you really want to focus on everyone feeling heard and taken seriously. Everyone has different stressors. Stressors you're experiencing right now are those important to you, which I might not find as important, but they're important to you and I care about you, so your stressors are important to me. You also want everyone to feel respected, affirmed, and validated. These experiences then lead to everyone to feeling loved, cared for, increases sense of trust, mutual support, which ultimately leads to a strengthened relationship. And at the end of the day, strengthened relationships reduce tension. And right now we've got enough tension going on outside of our families. Here's one strategy to help reduce that tension, which helps in a lot of ways, especially in parenting, which is a hard thing to do on a great day. More attention is just going to make it more challenging. Next slide. So the next two slides, I'm going to talk about the idea of weekly quality time a strategy to support routine opportunities to allow for constructive dialogues to occur, to allow for time to talk about feedback of what's going well, what's going okay, what needs to be improved. Again, ex describing each other's experiences, understanding, getting clarification about others' experiences. It's a time to express needs and desires rather than complaints and criticisms. It's a big difference of expressing, I need you to take the garbage out versus you never take the garbage out. Time to provide validation and again, take care of each other and support each other. The aspects of the quality time constructive dialogue, the routineness of it is going to provide you the stability part of resilience. The flexibility comes with the content. It's going to be changing within the conversation. Next slide. Mm, can you go back one slide, please? Thanks. Um, so here's some additional tips to support weekly quality time actually happening. Um, and again, providing that consistency and routine when you have expectation that reduces stress and anxiety. First one is the scheduling ahead, which is really important even when we find ourselves at home together a lot, seeing each other a lot, you get this idea of, oh, I see this person all the time, I don't need to schedule talking to them. Well, we do, time flies, day end happens, and then we've missed opportunities to have good quality conversations. It's also really important because the concept of scheduling is a representation that you're committing to this person and you're committing to yourself. So you're demonstrating this is important. I'm going to make time for it. I'm going to put it on my schedule and remind myself it's there. I often recommend viewing it as like a doctor's appointment, being that you're going to put it on your calendar. And if something comes up and you need to reschedule, you're going to let that person know and reschedule at that time of letting them know. Also, stuff comes up last minute, completely okay, but again, let the person know as soon as you can and reschedule it. And finally, treating it like a doctor's appointment in that if you don't feel like having the conversation, it's not an out to not have the conversation or not engage in the quality time. That's true for your team. If they're not in the mood. They still signed up for it, committed to it. Let's do this. It's also true for the caregivers taking that same approach. You also want to avoid electronics. Um, Quality time, I hear a lot of, oh, we watch TV shows together, we watch movies together. Absolutely great activities to do together. However, they're not great activities to support constructive dialogues. You can't really talk during a TV or a movie without annoying each other. Um, so you want to choose activities that allow conversations to happen. So it, focusing on activities that either are enjoyable activities and or mastery level mastery activities, similar to choosing something that you want to learn about, get better at, like baking. 
some for some families finding out these activities can be really easy the brainstorm make a list put it on the fridge it's there you keep adding to it some say it's hard to do this because you get that response of well we have nothing in common our interests are so different we just do our own thing that's the way things happen for those families, I always recommend having individuals separate and be on their own and make their own lists and then come back together and compare your lists. Surprisingly, you might find some commonalities and you didn't even know it. If you don't find commonalities, that's still completely okay because you're going to be talking to your teen and demonstrating, hey, I find you important. I want to know about your experiences. Tell me about your interests, and I'm going to engage with you. That's actually modeling a really healthy relationship skill where you're committed to engaging with this person, even if you're not a huge fan of their activities. So you're going to demonstrate, hey, tell me about anime or tell me about this video game because it's interesting to you. That's our quality time. I'm going to demonstrate I do that for you. I'm going to expect you to do it for me. And that's that compromise within relationships. Next slide. The second uh, form of conversations, collaborative problem solving. Goal for this is addressing issues together. Again, the stability comes from having these types of conversations on a regular basis. The flexibility of resilience comes with the fact that issues are going to keep changing. These types of conversations lead to an increased sense of trust within the relationship that when issues rise in the future, we're going to be able to work through them together, which again leads to the strengthening of the relationships. And I've already talked about how strength relationships can help in a lot of different ways. So during these conversations, you're going to want to focus on the in this together attitude, meaning you're going to enter the conversation with a focus on using we statements instead of I statements. I also recommend you enter it with humility and maintain having humility in the sense that this isn't a conversation to talk about who's right and wrong, who's better. It's a conversation about identifying issues that are occurring and how are we going to fix those issues together. The idea of accept that it's okay to be wrong is the fact that we don't always have great ideas at the first get-go. Our first ideas might not work out and that's completely okay. You go back to the drawing board. Additionally, it also means if someone else comes up with a really great idea, it doesn't reflect poorly on you. It doesn't mean you don't come up with good ideas either. You just are working together to figure out what's the best idea for you and this relationship, you and your team. To be able to come up with ideas, start with brainstorming sessions. And the key to brainstorming sessions is allow you to be creative, think outside the box, which means you're not evaluating ideas at this point. You're really looking at being receptive to any and all ideas. And when I see families either do this in my sessions um, or to hear about them doing them at home, I often hear them say when we truly think outside the box and get comfortable and think about a lot of different ideas, it actually leads to joking and fooling around and it gets getting silly, which is really good because then you're reducing the tension. It's a good interaction and you're still coming up with ideas. Um, sometimes I will model the idea. The concept of presenting an idea, in my head I'll know this idea is logistically impossible, but I'm going to still say it to demonstrate we are saying any idea and all ideas. And it gives the kids some trust of, oh, that's what that looks like, because they might not trust the idea that you're going to, if they say something, you're not going to judge them. Finally, you're going to follow the science experiment approach. Hypothesis, picking out an idea that you think is going to be the best, try it out through the testing. And then the last step, the most important step, and often the missed step is evaluating. Figure out, did it actually work? And if it didn't, no problem. You've already come up with a list of other ideas that you can turn to during your, from your brainstorming session. Next slide. So one opportunity to increase the routine of this consistency of having these type of conversations is through weekly business meetings. You can call them weekly family meetings, call them anything you want. But it's this idea of coming together as a unit, whether it's you and your teen or you and the whole family or you and your spouse, and going over topics from the previous week, looking at what went well, what needs improving, what still needs to happen. You're also going to be prioritizing. It's really hard to address all problems all at once effectively. The more effective approach is choosing a few problems to target, which means you might pick out the ones that are most important, or you might choose the ones that are the easiest, quickly check them off, move on to the next one. You pick and choose. Last part of it is recommendation of creating an action plan. Action plan is going to really target the specifics in clear, clearly written out, 
who does what, when, and how. Highly recommended to write this out in a way that can be easily shared. Again, put it on the fridge in the kitchen or put it in a Google Docs, whatever. The importance of writing it out is that then people can reference that and you don't need to memorize it. It reduces arguments in the future of who said what, when last week. Next slide. Here, I recommend some additional tips for supporting your setting up the weekly business. A lot of these will be similar to the weekly quality time. Um, one big difference, scheduling ahead of time. I also recommended that for the quality time. For this, the business meetings, I highly recommend picking the same day and time each week. It gets added to the routine. You don't have to think about it. It adds to clear expectations, which reduces anxiety. That's a little bit harder for quality time because some activities are weather pending or it requires a bit more scheduling and flexibility. But again, you want to show that it's important and valuable. Eliminate distractions. You also want to make sure you set aside enough time. That demonstrates this is important and we're going to make time for it. It's not just something I'm checking off my to-do list and moving on. Uh, I recommend aiming for like a 30-minute time frame. First couple of me meetings, you might need a bit more time to get used to the structure, get used to um, what we're talking about and who's talking about what and what's going to happen in these meetings. But as you go over and repeat this and get routine, you'll become more efficient. And finally, include topic. Everyone's going to be including in topics to talk about, and everyone's topics that are raised are treated seriously and respectfully. Next slide. Here's a third conversation dialogue suggestion. They're called daily check-ins, which are really just these brief moments that support either constructive dialogues and or collaborative problem solving. And these are opportunities in the day, in brief moments, five to 10 minutes, that allow you that quick feedback. If things are popping up, you can quickly address them versus pushing them off each week. But it's important to keep it brief to make it feel more manageable. I've included a couple of phrases that you could use to emphasize if a topic does come up that you know is going to take more than 10 minutes, emphasizing this is really important to me. I want to hear about this. We want to work on it, but we've got to reschedule it. Let's plan on it during this our family meeting time. I also recommend to help with including it in structure, routine, adding it to a daily activity that's already a part of everyone's routine. So for example, if you're using this strategy for a caregiver resilience, you both get up and have coffee, tea in the morning, that could be a time you do a daily check-in together. For a family unit, if you have family dinner time, before everyone can get up and do their own thing after dinner, you do a quick check-in with everyone, finding the times that may feel natural for your family. Next slide. Now we're going to shift to routines and structure. This Routines and structures are really helpful in a lot of different ways. Um, one way, it's just controlling the controllables and establishing consistent certainties, which is really helpful, especially these times, because there's so many uncontrollables happening, so much uncertainty happening. The routine and structure combat that in a great way. In order to set routine and structure, I recommend caregivers take the lead and provide the overall structure of the family, or overall structure of the relationship, but really include your kids in incorporating some flexibility, adding the what's and when's of different activities. That helps prevent you from feeling like you have to overly structure your kids and tell them what they're doing when they're doing it. Especially with teens, they're not going to be receptive to the idea of you're telling them what they're doing at all times of the day. You also want to make sure you're including opportunities for work and for fun and breaks. It is very, very easy, especially when you're working from home, to get caught up in all the everything I need to get done and lose track of the time for getting outside and getting fresh air and having a laugh of just relaxing with your friends or relaxing on your own or being with your family. So sometimes, especially when things are feeling hectic, structure it in at those times for fun and breaks. I also recommend respecting and supporting each other's routines. In that, for example, if someone sets the idea of every morning I'm gonna wake up and go for a walk before I start my day, as a family member, you wanna respect that and you don't wanna get in the way of that unless something absolutely necessary is happening. By you respecting that and giving them their structure and their space, they're gonna return the favor for you. And then I included some strategies on how to support routines of shared schedules, the daily check-ins, workspace stuff. Next slide. 
Next, I'm going to shift to house rules and expectations. These are another strategies for establishing consistency and stability, the half of resilience. Before I get into this, though, I do want to highlight rules and expectations vary from house to house, family to family. So I'm not here to tell you what your family should be doing for rules and expectation. It's really a true decision within the family. What I do want to do is convey some ideas and strategies on how to set it up for success. One being framing your rules and expectations in a positive way, really focusing on what should be done rather than what to avoid. The idea of giving the structure of what should be done gives direction and guidance, whereas saying stop doing that stops there. You're not giving any alternative. You're not giving any suggestions. So an extreme example would be if I told my child, stop eating that cookie before dinner, and I stopped there. That gives that child an out to be like, they'll eat a piece of pie. I didn't tell them what else to do. They found a loophole, good for them, but it's not helping the situation. Now I'm mad at them for not listening to me and they're still eating before dinner. But another option would have been, hey, let's hear some snack options before dinner. These are what you can choose from. Or dinner's in five minutes, here's a glass of water. Sit here and talk to me for five minutes while I get dinner set on the table or help me out setting it on the table. Rules and expectations are gonna include general, and specifics. General is falling more into the family values aspects of being respectful, spending time together, where specifics are going to be more in those day-to-day -day what things look like. For example, family dinner time. Everyone needs to come to the table, no cell phones allowed, and TVs are turned off. When you're identifying rules and expectations, I highly recommend that you involve your kids as much as possible. The more they're involved in the identifying and planning, the more buy-in they're going to have. More buy-in is going to be more follow-through. And sometimes you might be surprised on the ideas that they have. And finally, review and adjust the rules during the family business meetings. These are giving you structure, but it doesn't mean that you have to stick with these for months on end. Things change, adversity is happening, COVID-19 is here, things are changing at a rapid pace sometimes, we've got to adjust appropriately. And that's why we have this combination of stability, flexibility to allow you to be resilient. Next slide. So I've talked about identifying rules, expectations, first step, second step, sometimes the most important step is the follow through. One of the biggest ideas, most effective ways of having follow through, having compliance is positive reinforcement. And that can look like verbal praise and acknowledgement, which can really go a long way. Even if you imagine times where you've done stuff in the family, you've done stuff for the family that has become routine, it's become kind of expected of you, the more you do it, crickets. You're not getting any comment from everyone. Initially, that might feel really bad, might feel yucky, or might feeling not seen or appreciated. Over time, you might have built a tolerance for that. It's like, oh, that's just what happens, but it still doesn't feel great. Then reflect on times where you've done stuff and someone said, thank you so much for doing that. Thanks so much for taking the time to cook me dinner. It was really good, and I appreciate it. I know you're super stressed today. That feels great, and it gives you that boost of they see me, and I'm going to keep doing this. Kids need that too, just as much as we as adults need it. For kids also, it gives them that feedback of what you're doing is what I want, you to, want to see you do, so keep doing that. When giving praise positive reinforcement, it's suggested to give it as close to the time that you see the action as possible. It's especially true for kids, small kids. Just how they are cognitively, their concept of time is really skewed. If you tell them two days later, they're not going to remember anything that happened and it's not going to be meaningless. Teenagers have a better concept of time but still struggle, so the sooner you can give it to when they do it, the better. Also make it specific. There's a big difference between saying thanks for being good today and thanks for taking out the garbage. I really appreciate it. That was a huge help. I also want to mention the difference between rewards and bribery. That question gets brought up a lot when I'm working with parents and kids in sessions. Rewards mean you're giving the positive reinforcement after something is done. Bribery means you're giving it before something's done. We as therapists are always recommending the reward approach. It's effective and it works. Even when I tell caregivers that, they still don't feel great about it. They feel like they're training their kid to have, have this idea of anything you do, you're going to get something for it, where life, that's not always the case. 
However, reality is there's no one that's 100% intrinsically motivated to do things, especially when those things are chores and work. We need those reinforcements. We need those awards to keep going. Kids need that too. I also want to mention rewards don't always have to cost money. You can get creative. You can think outside the box of extending some privileges. Um, some people, kids, little kids will get excited of being able to choose dinner or a teen might be able to choose where you're going to get pickup from at a restaurant. However, speaking of teens though, allowances are age appropriate and have opportunities for other types of learning, teachable moments. They can learn money management. Also gives them a chance to be independent. Here's some money, choose how you want to spend it. That independence they're really seeking throughout time, especially at this time of their life. Next slide. Here's my last strategy. I want to mention, I just went through a lot of slides, like rambling a lot of information, throwing it at you. I hope you're digesting a couple of things. But you can throw it all out the window if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not in a good space. Care of others starts with care of self. So it's really important to take time for yourself to recharge for yourself. But a reminder, all the strategies I just mentioned can be applied to self-reliance, meaning you can set routines for yourself. You can set aside time on your own to do your own weekly check-in to assess your needs and problem solve. I also recommend you know, using that phrase of get back to the basics. These five things mentioned here, nutrition, getting moving, sleep, are commonly forgot about or minimized in terms of the importance. They're pushed aside. The day gets busy. All of a sudden, we're thinking, I'll eat later, I'll eat later, and you get to the end of the day and you didn't have lunch. Sometimes happens. It's essential to make sure you're eating and getting to the basics. Um, I'll have clients come in. They'll mention, hey, I'm getting into a fights with my family a lot. I'll always ask them, where are you at with your basics? And if they tell me they're not eating, they're not sleeping, then I'm not going to be surprised that they're irritable, and I'm not going to be surprised that their irritations, irritability lead to more fighting. You also want to focus on what works for you when it comes to relaxation and recharging. And then adding them to your routine and structure with a sense of value and importance, reminding yourself you've got to do this in order to do the stuff you want to do with your teen, in order to do the things that you need in the house. And also reflect back to March to June. You've kind of been through this before. What worked for you then? What didn't work for you then? What was an idea of recharging that just is not fitting right now? And adjust to that. And finally, daily clean slate start, viewing each day as a clean state slate, starting fresh and waking up that morning and asking yourself, what did you learn from yesterday? What did you, how can you grow from yesterday? And reflecting back, resilience is a process of learning and growing. And it gives you a chance to start fresh that day. Next slide. Some final takeaways. Reminder, resilience is the process of balancing stability and flexibility when faced with adversity. You're going to be wanting to aim to achieve what's good enough for you and your family. Do not get caught up comparing yourself to everyone else because it's a new experience for everyone. No one really has got the all figured out. No one's really doing it perfectly. And even if they look like they are, they're not actually. And at the same time, even if people have in the neighborhood um, or in your family figured out what's working for them, it doesn't necessarily, it's going to mean it's working for you or working for your family. So focus on what's good enough for you and your family. Resilience doesn't eliminate bad days. It accepts bad days happen and is prepared for them. And finally, resilience was important before COVID. It's going to be important after COVID. So the effort you put into building up resilience is going to pay off after this is all said and done. Next slide. Thanks, Cody. Nice job. That was really good. Um, hi, this is David Hartman. I'm a social worker from Glenbrook South High School. Um, before I start, I just want to kind of take a minute to thank all of you who are showing up. I think it speaks to, well, it probably speaks a little bit to the anxiety that we're all experiencing, that we're all here listening and, and trying to figure out what we can do to support ourselves and our kids. But it also speaks to our community, um, the, cohesion, the cohesion that we have in our community, the collaboration. And so I want to just say thank you for showing up. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, the first thing that I'll start with is uh, this idea that this isn't last spring. Um, 
I think it might even be important not to compare this period of time with what happened in the spring. Spring was a surprise to all of us, caught us off guard in so many different ways, not just sort of familially, but emotionally, academically, and lots, uh, lots of different ways. And I would argue that in many respects, we really weren't prepared, um, but we're ready. Um, we're as ready as we can be, and we're trying to come together now to learn to figure out how we can really support each other in this time. Our expectations are completely different. Um, the mandate sort of last spring was let's do no harm. Let's try to figure out emotionally how to protect ourselves um, physically and emotionally. And, 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 and now it is let's really figure out how we teach ourselves, how we teach our kids, and how we manage this in a way that is rigorous and thoughtful um, and I think we are ready. So given that, I really want to point out, I think I've heard a lot of um, anxiety um, from parents and community members about this idea that what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to me? Um, obviously, our experiences are ours individually, but I think it's important to understand that everybody is experiencing these same struggles educationally, um, colleges and universities are creating curriculum, creating totally programs open. for how to support, right, it's okay. Forget it. support our students. Um, and, and it's important to know that because what we are doing here at Glenbrook South and at Glenbrook North is, I hope, I believe, doing it to the best of our abilities. And we're a top-notch place that's going to really prepare our kids to the most to the best way possible. And everybody across the nation is dealing with something similar. So our colleges and universities are gonna be ready for that. So it's important. Uh, Jen, can you go to the next one for me? So we're talking about motivation, connection and engagement um, to our lives, our, our academic lives primarily. And I think it's really important to talk about the parental support. I think I've been a social worker for, you can see the gray, a lot of years. And, um, and I think maybe in this time, parental support and, our, and your assistance, our assistance to our kids is going to be as important as ever. And in that vein, I want to talk about a couple of different things. I love it that, that um, Cody talked about sort of self-care, this idea that you put on your own oxygen mask first. You really got to take care of yourself. And I call that distress tolerance. <clears throat> I don't want to presume that everybody's having negative feelings because I don't think that that's true. There are sort of positive things and negative things that are going to happen to each of us and they're all going to be different. But I want to highlight this point that it's okay for us, for ourselves, to sit with the distress that we have. That sometimes, it, you know, our kids are going to be distressed. They're going to be angry, anxious, sad. Um, and... and, and teaching them that it's okay to sit with that is a really important skill. And partly we do that, I'm going to talk about modeling a lot from parent support, but partly we do that by doing that ourselves. Um, this idea that you can handle it, that this is something that you can do, um, and it's okay to have some negative feelings. You can work through those negative feelings, and we can help our kids uh, work through those as well. Part of that is radical acceptance. Cody talked a little bit about this too. It's the idea that what can you control and what can't you control? And sometimes in these, when there's so much uncertainty and so much change and so much that's different, it's hard to latch on to those things that we can. We want to be in control of different things, and it's very difficult. So this idea of radical acceptance is we can't control everything, so how do we accept that that's the case and do what we can do in our own, in our own um, space? The next point that I think is, is, is really important is to kind of accept and validate um, I think probably um, Kate's going to talk a little bit about this as well when you're talking to your kids, but our kids are going to experience different things and different emotions. And the more we can sit with our kids' discomfort too and accept that what they're experiencing is their experience and validate those feelings, I think that's going to set the stage for how we can then talk to our kids and figure out what we need to do to move forward um, with, with, how to manage that. Um, there's going to be a whole spectrum of things. I want to tell you a quick story, a uh, whole spectrum of positivity and potentially lack of positivity. Um, and it changes. I was talking to a peer, uh, 
one of the teachers of our peer leader program, and he was talking about how, how much he loves it. And this time is normally when this big group of kids come together and they all do these fun activities and it's this enormous group and how fun that is. And he said, the difference this time is that they're doing things in smaller pods. And he said, what has happened is that these kids have started to sort of act as their own little families. And so when they have breaks, when it was the big group, they sort of scattered to their friends and things. Now when they have breaks, he said, it's amazing. They sit down with each other and they're having conversations that are, I don't know, beautiful. And, you know, I'm a social worker, so I use those words, but it's really, he said it was really cool to see. And it's an unexpected positive experience from this sometimes awful time. So, um, so <laughs> excuse me, accept and validate your kids' feelings. Then, Jen, we could do a whole, or excuse me, Cody, we could do a whole um, uh, webinar on resilience, but modeling resilience is really key. We can handle this. Resilience traits are things that can be learned and fostered and grown. And the more that you do that, the more your kids will be able to do that as well. And this final piece is like this idea about how do you pivot? The more you can pivot and be flexible and adaptable during these trying times, um, the more that your kids will be able to do that as well. School's gonna look a lot different and it's gonna change, right? We have right now a formula to move through phases where, and we hope we move through quickly, but where we move through phases, but things might happen a month down the road that cause us to step back. And that's okay if the more we can pivot and be flexible and adapt, the better off we're gonna be for our kids to be able to support our kids. Um, next one, please, Jen. Um, so being engaged academically and socially, I think this is a real key. I think our community is really often focused on sending our kids to great schools and we should be. Um, but in this crazy time, we should be promoting that idea and promoting this idea that being engaged is being balanced as well. So there's academic engagement. Um, you know, how do you stay engaged academically? There's gonna be synchronous learning. Um, we're gonna have the camera on. We're gonna expect that kids are engaged in that and we want kids to. And the more that you can support that, the better off we're gonna be. Being engaged with teachers, sending emails, asking for, asking for, um, for help with things, it's really critical. But being balanced in that social engagement is also critical. Actually, Cody talked about family engagement, right? This idea that we are beings with experiences in a lot of different realms and we want to make sure that we're trying to be engaged in all of them. Let's not lose focus on the family piece. Let's not lose focus on the social engagement at the expense of the academics because they're all really important. That social engagement I think is going to look different obviously, but um, there are going to be ways to safely get together with peers depending on where we are in our phases in terms of our um, municipalities and our state and, and in our schools, there are going to be ways to be safe and to get engaged, not just via technology, but face-to-face -face with some social distancing. And those are really important. We want to make sure that we're encouraging our kids to do that as well as be engaged academically. The academics are going to be rigorous. I, I, I really believe that that's going to be the case. So let's also be promoting the other pieces, familially, socially, and emotionally. Balance is beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Cummings, for creating such a nice, uh, a nice graphic for us. All right, Jen, let's, thank you very much. Okay, so connectedness. This is a little similar to like engagement, right? We wanna make sure that we're connected across these different areas. Um, and the more we are, I think the better students that our kids are gonna be too. So we wanna make sure, how do we stay connected to peers and friends? You know, um, potentially the sport that we were doing isn't in, in, um, isn't in season right now, it got pushed back to the spring. But what are the different ways that we can be involved in those activities? Is there a different activity that we can get connected with in, instead? There are lots of different ways in our communities and in our schools to be connected both with activities and with peers. And the more that we can do that, um, I think that uh, Cody talked about this as well, that our support networks are so critical to us being healthy, productive humans, and that's connectedness. And that's connectedness with peers, friends, our academics, our teachers, and obviously activities. 
Cody talked a lot about family and I'm really happy for that. And I think it's a testament to you guys that there are so many hundreds of you watching today. Um, maintaining those connections is critical. And again, we talk about balance. Let's try to do all those so we can have a support network that allows us to thrive. And actually that connectedness is going to help us really be motivated to do as, as well as we can in our other areas, in sports or in academics in different ways. So super critical. Thanks, Jen. This is going to be the final piece in terms of how we help our kids um, be um, motivated and engaged and connected. And I don't want to, you know, go in too much. Um, there's some, 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 some things here, but Cody went into um, a, a really nice uh, talk about routine and structure. Have conversations. Talk to your kids. Again, accept and validate their realities and then try to find conversations around what do we need to do for each other? What are our expectations? In terms of routines and structure, you may be home as well, doing your work from home. Um, there might be other students in the, in the house trying to figure out how to do their e-learning. Who's going to study where? How are we going to do the chores? How are we going to share obligations? You know, um, are we going to share who gets to decide for dinner? Uh, what's for dinner? And then that, that's, that Though that kid can then help you go to the store and get the ingredients and potentially help cook. Lots of different ways to have those conversations, to have the routines and the structures so that the rest of it makes sense to be able to stay engaged and stay connected. Um, and then, you know, this consistency, we talked a little bit about this before, but being consistent as much as you can is going to really help the kids. So meals, bedtimes, um, Cody talked about some of the conversations or the family meetings, being consistent with those so that kids' expectations, so that if things change globally or in the school, the things that happen with your home, the routines and structures that you have in place that can continue, I think will really help all of you adapt to the changes if and when they happen. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I was going to say something and it just, I've lost my mind, but um, the, your parental support is really critical to stay motivation so the kids can stay motivated and engaged. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Kate from Youth Services now. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm, I am glad that you guys are joining us. I think just the fact that you're here watching us shows that you really care about your students. Um, and care about their success this year, which is huge. Um, so what do we want to do next? Remember, we're doing the best we can. None of us have been in this spot before. We're all kind of in the same boat. Um, so as parents, how do we model hope, optimism, and confidence um, by helping our kids do the best they can do, knowing that this is a really stressful time and we don't know how long this will be going on. Um, so I think speaking to them, you can figure this out, right? Empowering them, helping them know that they have the skills and that we as parents are here to su support them, right? And these are great skills for the future, for jobs, for colleges, that they're gonna be on their own needing to figure things out. Um, and we as parents aren't always gonna be there with them. So how can we support them in this time? Um, when your student struggles, not if, right? We're all gonna have some struggles more so than not this year. Um, let's ask clarifying questions. Um, I love what Cody said about getting back to the basics. How has your sleep been? Um, are you breathing, right? Take a deep breath right now. Breathing impacts the nervous system and our nervous systems are all a little uh, rattled with anxiety right now. So how's your sleep? What are you eating? Are you drinking water? Um, technology use, right? Are your kids up on their phone all night? And is that impacting their, their stress level? Um, clarifying is, are you struggling with your academics? Or is it feeling isolated and alone? Do we need to do some social connecting? Or is there an academic piece we can work on? Um, do you need more structure, right? We've been talking this whole evening about how to create routine and structure and have family kind of um, meetings to talk about what we all need. Um, let's talk through that. And then promoting the autonomy and self-advocacy. Again, 
you guys, your kids can figure this out with your support. Um, I can sit with you, I can help you, but I shouldn't be emailing your teacher for you, right? These are life skills when your kids have a job or they're going to college. Um, these are skills they're gonna need for doing all of that at that time. And so they're really great to develop right now. Um, I think exploring with them, what are your choices? What are your options? Can you do this or this? Do you need help with this? Um, choices are a great way to say, um, this is your choice. Let's figure out what the options are. Um, and then identifying um, the resources that are available to them um, and practicing reaching out to those people. Is there a teacher or a friend you can connect with? Um, these are really important skills for your kids to learn, especially the older they get in high school as they're looking forward toward graduating, getting a job or going to college, um, being able to make these choices and figure these things out for themselves are really important. And so now is kind of that resiliency factor, some time to grow that um, when they're being, feeling really stressed. Um, and you're alongside them. You're there to support them in this. Um, and you may, again, be working from home so or doing other things, so you might not be able to be there all the time. Um, the next few slides are some examples of just how we can talk to our kids, how we can process some questions with them. Um, probably a lot of scenarios that a lot of you may deal with, with just the stress of kiddos and going back to e-learning. Um, so hopefully this will be a little helpful. Um, so next slide, please, Jen. Um, so you're setting up a space in your house for e-learning this year with your child. As you're moving their desk into place together, they say, I don't even know why we're bothering. This year is going to be a complete waste. It's not going to be, I'm not going to learn anything anyway, right? That, that feeling of complete helplessness, what's the point? This is so frustrating. I don't want to do it. Um, I think as parents, it's really easy to jump to the problem solving or the just solution finding of it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it, we'll figure it out. And I think what's really important um, that both David and Cody have mentioned is how do we sit in validating, sit in those hard feelings of, you're right, this year is going to be very different than last year. This year may not feel really good compared to other years when you're in school. Um, again, how can we take a breath? Just sit in those hard feelings that, yeah, this stinks. And then when we're able to, we might have to take a break and go back. Um, recognizing the choices or challenging a little bit of, you know, it's your choice how you want this year to look. It's your choice for how you engage with your learning this year um, to complete the goals that you, you have in mind um, or partner with them in problem solving. What do you think would be some obstacles? What do you think um, you can do um, to make things better this year or to change how it was in the spring, right? Um, so I think as a parent, you can partner with your kids in helping them come up with solutions too. And like Cody said, sometimes you want to lay out all the options, no wrong answer, just to see what comes up um, because it is going to be a different year and we're more prepared now, right? We're more prepared going into the school year. Kids are more ready to know what to expect. Um, teachers are going to be more prepared with communicating what's going on. Um, so I think again, holding those feelings and also sitting with, all right, now it's up to, to us to work together to figure out how can we make this year more successful and let's create a plan. What, what would that plan look like to be more successful? Um, next slide, please, Jen. All right, your child is setting up, getting set up with an e-learning platform. When you ask them how it's going, they tell you, I just can't learn virtually like this. Online school just isn't for me and I'm not going to be able to learn this year. How could you respond? Um, again, validate. I know e-learning isn't what you would choose. I know that this situation is not how any of us want it, right? I think as a parent, you can share a little bit of, this is not what I want to be doing either. Um, and we're going to get through it together, right? We're going to figure this out. We're going to have bad days and that's okay. And we're going to have some good days. Um, ask clarifying questions when it's like, this is the worst, nothing's going to work. Well, tell me more about that, right? What specifically is bothering you? What's, what feels most challenging right now? Um, what feels a little bit less challenging? What do you think is something we can tackle right now? Um, if there's any way to help your, yourself or your kids feel empowered, that is a great way to get momentum going. Um, and then problem solving again. Have you reached out to your teacher or friends for help? Um, I wonder if there's other people struggling. If you have friends struggling, can you guys kind of come together and just 
vent a little bit of, yeah, this really stinks, but we're going to do it. We're going to get through it and we can talk about that together, right? That um, connectedness that David was talking about, those support networks are really important. Um, next slide, Jen. You and your child are trying to schedule an appointment around their new e-learning schedule. And as they read over it, they blurt out frustratedly, this year is going to suck. All the good parts of school just aren't happening. No lunch, no friends, no nothing, just boring classes. How could you respond? Um, and again, I think conflict and frustration often comes out too when we're tired, when we're hungry, when we just need a break. So it's important to keep those in mind. Um, again, sitting in the feelings. I hear you. Not getting time to spend with your friends does really suck, right? This year is not going to be as good maybe as you were hoping it to be. And also there might be some hidden positives, but it's okay to sit in the feelings and say, right, it sucks right now. We're having a bad day. Let's take a break. Let's do something else and think about something else for a little bit. Um, and again, clarify, what are you planning to do? What would you like to do for lunch breaks? You know, can you call someone can you set up a friend day? Can you structure your day to have different breaks throughout the day or get outside, do some learning outside if you're able to? Um, I think managing the feelings and creating a little bit of a plan, even if it's a little tiny baby step of like, let's just figure out today, right? Let's create a plan today. If you can create more structure and grow from that, that's huge. That sets up even better for the year. But some days it's just today um, and that's okay. And I think again, remembering to take deep breaths, all of us to get those basic needs met of sleep, healthy eating habits, uh, checking the technology, because um, there's gonna be a lot of technology happening and that can be really draining. Um, and then I think if you're able to figure out what are the hidden positives in the midst of this, um, to just bring some lightness to this hard time can again, just kind of flip a switch to keep keep things moving in the right direction. And sometimes kids just need a break. They might need to just stop thinking about it for a moment and maybe they do a little bit of homework and then they have a break and then they do a little bit more and they have a break. Um, we need those rewards built in. We need time to rest as our expectations might need to be lowered this year. Um, and that's okay to, again, breathe. We're figuring this out together. We're not alone. We have this great team uh, working things out. Um, and again, the fact that parents that you guys are here watching and supporting your kids just shows how much you care and how much you want a really great year. Um, so thanks again for having me be a part of this. I think this was my last slide and I'm going to um, pass it back to you guys. Thanks. Hi, I'm Bridget Buckland. I'm a school psychologist at Glenbrook North, and I just wanted to spend a few minutes reviewing some of the supports that we have available in our district. Um, we have many staff members in student services who are available to help support students, um, and we certainly this year anticipate our the needs are going to be um, just as high or if not higher um, with students needing support, uh, especially as we transition back to school. So we're very ready um, to help support students through our student services departments, as well as help support families in connecting with resources in the community. So um, in most cases, if you're not quite sure who to contact, but you have some concerns about your student or, or another student, someone in the community, um, a school counselor is going to be the best person to contact because they really can um, help connect students with other supports in the building as well as in the community. Um, they're very knowledgeable and can be a really good first step. Um, along those same lines, if you have concerns about any student um, within our district, uh, in addition to contacting staff directly, you can use one of our um, anonymous referral methods. We have the text-to-tip hotline, and that's what you're seeing on the slide there. Um, so you can use the text-to-tip, or you can use one of the concern forms. Um, those are anonymous, and they are checked. Um, there's a notification that comes up immediately, so we do try our best to respond to those as quickly as we can. Um, so those are also options that are available to parents, to community members, and also to students. 
Um, to help support our students, um, all of the students in the district, we are going to be working with the PE department um, to implement a six-week social-emotional curriculum for all students. Um, some of the topics that we're planning to address are uh, processing emotions related to the pandemic, um, learning healthy coping strategies, staying connected to the community, um, and demonstrating resilience. There is a journal that we've created for each student that's being sent home uh, very soon. Um, and there's gonna be some more detailed information for students and parents about what that curriculum is gonna look like. Um, Jen, next slide. Right. And then we are very fortunate to have some strong partnerships with community agencies um, in Glenview and Northbrook, including Youth Services, Family Service Center, and Compass, um, among others. And these agencies are working with families to remove barriers to accessing mental health support, including financial barriers. Um, many of the agencies work on a sliding scale um, and can help families access that despite um, any challenge that might be going on environmentally. Um, the number of options can certainly be overwhelming, so student services staff at both high schools can help navigate those resources um, and help identify the right supports for a student. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to um, Eric Etherton. Thanks, Bridget, and thanks to all the panelists for speaking tonight and uh, the support of Catch to partner with us. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, I was recently having a conversation with my family and many of my colleagues, uh, two different conversations, but the same topic um, last week, right around the 1st of August. I've been in education for 30 years. This is my 30 year, 31st year that I'm starting education. And, and I can honestly say every single year when it gets to August 1st, I start to get these butterflies in my stomach. I get this excitement. School is right around the corner. And I have to say, talking with my family, all our WHO educators, and with my colleagues, they're excited as well. So hopefully that's a message that you're hearing tonight. Um, I, I love some of the stories that we heard David Hartman, I think, um, from that peer group leader, kids working in small pods, making really good solid connections, having conversations, maybe meeting kids that they never had. We do have an opportunity here. And so every school year, bring some excitement, hopefully to all of you. So my hope for all of you is that you feel a little bit of excitement and anticipation coming into the school year. That's what I would hope for you. School can be exciting. At the same time, we recognize there is stress and there is some anxiety. We all feel that. We're concerned about the future. What's it gonna look like? Are we gonna be able to really um, move through the phases so we can get all the kids into the building? And our goal is Yes, that we're going to try to, to navigate this the best we can. And what we really need is the support of you as parents and the support and collaboration with our students. So we're all here for you. We want you to have that excitement. Students are starting to come back slowly, and our staff is reentering our buildings as we speak. It's been great to see everybody returning into the school um, slowly and, and connecting again with, with our community. So thank you again. We're going to open it up for a Q&A, and I will turn it over to Amy. It's directed to Cody. And the question is, having planned conversations with your kids sometimes feels forced, and I feel like a dictator to require it. How do I make it happen when my kid is resistant? So I think... Coming from the perspective of if this something is something new to the family, if having a family meeting is new, it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel awkward. If you're some, um, a parent, a caregiver, taking the notes from what this presentation, you've provided a lot of different statements you could say. If some of these statements don't feel natural. That's completely okay. But the more you talk about it, the more you set it up, the more natural it's going to feel. I also highly recommend, especially when talking to teenagers, something that really helps with them is understanding the why. If you talk with them about why you want to connect with them through these meetings, why you're making the time for it, they'll understand or hopefully understand where you're coming from and they'll likely be more receptive to the idea. If you're telling them, hey, we've got to have this meeting because I tell you we need this meeting, Teens are going to not be receptive. Uh, I'd imagine most adults are not going to be receptive to that approach either. But really sitting down with them and talking about the reasons behind it and why you're motivated. And problem solve with them. Hey, this is an idea I have. How can we make this work for all of us? So those are a few suggestions. Great. Thanks, Cody. 
Um, this next question is directed to David. David, can you speak a little more about radical acceptance? How important is our attitude and response to change and the unknown? Uh, I, feel, I don't think you can underestimate um, how important the attitude is. Um, radical acceptance is the, thing, is the idea that I, I don't like this. Um, I'm uncomfortable, um, but it is what it is. And so sitting with it, you know, sort of in quotation, sitting with it, accepting the fact that you can't, we can't change this. So then you can say, okay, so I can accept this. I radically accept this, even though I don't like it. But if you can get to that place, then you can get to the place that says, okay, now what do I get to control? What do I have with me? And what I have is my ability to respond. So if I can be thoughtful about that, and rather than, I mean, there are any number of negative things, and I'd rather not focus on that, but rather than do something that doesn't help you, radically accept that situation. Um, and you could go with e-learning, right? I think there are lots of folks who'd rather be in school in, in a full kind of typical education setting than, have, than do e-learning. But if I radically accept that and I say, it is what it is, I don't get to control that. Now I get to say to myself, great. Now what do I want to do with that? How do I make the best of it? Where are the positives in it? Who are my support networks? And it's just easier. I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks, David. Um, this next question is, can you address, and, and this is for anybody, can you address an incoming freshman coming from a Chicago school? How is it best for this new student to meet new people given our current situation? I think that's a, a great question. I think we can, we can try to answer that um, between the two schools. Um, right now we're preparing for freshman orientation um, in both of our high schools, trying to bring in obviously the, the newest class to our school to try to help them feel connected. Um, and that also includes transfer students. So any transfer student can join in on that orientation and we would welcome that. So depending on which school you're at, GBN or GBS, please just feel free to contact the student services department. So that would be the starting point. Uh, we also do some work through the student services department, um, working with what we call uh, newcomers, um, so students that are transferring in from other schools, we have some supports in place to get those newcomers, the transfer students together, meet current students, talk through kind of what our schools are all about, what our schedule looks like, um, what kind of support we can provide so that they're feeling comfortable and connected to our school. So that will be going on throughout the school year. Um, and then also their counselor. Their counselors were really important to kind of connect with that individual to start talking about what are you interested in? What are your passions? What have you been involved in, in the past in, in your former school? What activities would you like to get involved with here? That counselor can help navigate that student to start to make some connections. Even though we're starting out in e-learning, we still will be connected through the student services department with all the families and all the students. And so we will start to connect right away, um, starting next week with the freshman orientation and working with the transfer students. And if I, can right. add, if I can add, Amy, real quick to what Eric said, mm -hmm. we're still, our activities, many of our clubs, and I would argue probably most of our clubs are going to still meet. They'll meet differently depending on the size of the club. They, meet, they may meet virtually. I, I um, do a club. I co-facilitate a club, and we're going to meet weekly. It's a great group of kids. It's a pretty small group of kids. But if the student can identify the things that he or she likes, as Eric said, and contact the counselor, the counselor can really help steer towards some of these activities and facilitate the discussion with the leaders of those groups, find out when it is. And I think that they'll find most of the clubs are really quite welcoming. Great, thank you. Okay, Kate and David both mentioned the importance of helping our kids find the hidden positives. Can you give us some pointers about how to get that conversation going daily, weekly, especially if a child is particularly angry or closed off? Yeah, I can jump on that one to start, David. Okay. Um, I think in general, I would say as a family, if you can start a family practice around gratitude or around um, naming some of those things that are, you know, you know, what are some highs and lows um, during the week can be helpful. I think 
it's really important again to continue validating because sometimes as parents we want to say oh you're having a rough day well it's going to get better or we're going to make it through and so i think it's really important to hang in to validate and again that radical acceptance of things don't feel really comfortable they are a struggle right now i think that can be important especially for those kiddos who are really struggling um to not um invalidate what they're feeling um, but I think small practices of checking in, you know, with those family check-ins of like, what's one thing that went well today? What's one thing that was okay? And what's one thing that was a struggle, right? So kind of balancing both sides. And then um, I think finding with the family some gratitude. Yeah, it's good. In, in our family, we play best, worst, funniest. And, it, you know, it's just a cute kind of simple way you can go into as much detail as you want, but it's a kind of a simple way to recognize that in every day, they're usually, if you allow yourself to see them, they're usually all three of those. Thank you. Um, this next question, I hear a lot about, you know, among my own community about um, kids worrying that they're going to fall behind. So the question is, how can we be reassured that our kids will learn academically during e-learning? Can I jump in there? Because I tried to address this when I talked and potentially I didn't do a good enough job, but I think that um, it's an unknown right now because in the spring, we, we, we were so hyper-focused on kids and our own emotional needs. I think that you'll find that the curriculum and the classes, there's going to be a lot of rigor. And it will be different. I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat things. It will be different, but I think it'll be rigorous. And then what I would say to that is that collectively, nationwide, statewide, we're all, all of our students are dealing with the same things. And if we're preparing an experience for our kids to the best of our ability with lots of rigor, lots of expectations, lots of support, I think that what we'll find, just like whether, when we're in classes, GBN and GBS do such a great job preparing our kids compared to nationwide trends. I think because everybody's dealing with this and because we're doing such a great job, I, I think that we will find that all of our kids are going to be really quite well prepared. And our colleges and universities are really doing a nice job recognizing that things are changing, that nothing is the same and they're tempering their expectations based on this nationwide phenomena of e-learning. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, I completely agree with what David said, and I just wanted to add one thing um, that I think probably isn't as well known in the communities is how hard our staff have been working this summer to train, um, attending workshops, learning new technology tools, um, and developing and adapting the curriculum for their classes. Um, and I've been so inspired by the work that I've seen from my colleagues, um, and it has made me or given me the opportunity to kind of think creatively and and think more positively about what's coming up for us um, than I had previously felt, you know, in April and May when things felt a little bit more um, dire. So I think I agree it's going to be different, but I have been very excited by what I've been seeing from my colleagues so far. Great. Thank you. Okay, here's an important one. Um, what if my children act like everything is okay, but really they are depressed? Uh, yeah, I saw that one on there too. Um, I think as a parent, that can be really hard to know what to do. I think looking for those signs of not eating or eating too much or isolating from people, um, sleeping really long or not enough. I think reaching out for help is really important, whether it's, you know, to a mental health agency, the school counselor, teachers, um, teachers and school counselors are sometimes the first ones to notice it too. Grades start dropping or assignments aren't getting completed. Um, I think getting your kids connected with someone who can support them, whether like we're at youth services or um, 
if you're really, really worried, um, getting them evaluated um, is really important. The school social worker can totally connect you with resources, um, and I think they support parents in that as well, as well as students. Um, but definitely, I think that is important to keep an eye on. Yeah, I, would, I would agree if I could just add on a little bit to what Kate said. The school counselor, I think, would be a really good um, maybe email or call to if, if you feel comfortable contacting that individual. That counselor can look at the grades, the attendance, and connect with the teachers, not to share any background information from the parent, but just to kind of probe the teachers. How is the student doing your class? You know, it's informal, trying to gather some information. Sometimes we can pick out patterns from that um, initial query and then collaborate further with the parent when the counselor has that information and try to go from there. And then if it's okay with the parent, call the student in, just have a general conversation, not going in depth first about, are you depressed? We would kind of uh, maneuver that conversation carefully so we can build up to the point to kind of assess what's going on. And then yes, linking to other outside agencies if we need to, but we also have social workers and psychologists available in our staff that can jump in and help if needed. So. We're here as a resource, please feel free to contact us and we will help navigate that question and that situation with you all. Thank you. Okay, here's one that um, I'm sure a lot of parents can relate to. My kids have been so used to playing video games 24 seven, especially as it's their only way to connect with their peers right now. Do you have any advice for imposing more limits around video games when school begins? I feel like Cody would be a good one to talk about this, but um, because she did a nice job sort of describing how to create authentic conversations around expectations. And for me, that would be one of them. Um, you know, you <laughs> honor the fact that, the, that that's a social outlet for a kid, but you also talk about balance and expectations and um, engagement. And I think that may help provide the space for, compromising with your kids about what helps them be well-rounded, healthy students and what potentially gets in the way of that. Cody, you want to jump in too? Yeah, I'd add a couple of other things too of going back to what I mentioned before of explaining the rationale, talking about the importance of balance in life um, and where you're coming from and supporting them in expanding what they're doing throughout the day. I think also as you prepare for the school year coming, start talking about rules and expectations now with the intention of you're going to have to get up earlier for school. So staying up all night playing these games are not going to work. So we've got to get you on a different schedule. Similar to if COVID wasn't around, it's this time where you get back to a different sleep schedule. I would also support the child, teen, challenging this thought of this is the only way I can connect with my peers. I'm very confident if we thought about things, went back to that brainstorm session, thought about anything and everything, there might be some strategies, might be some other ways to connect with peers, even in person in safe ways or virtually. Um, and I also suspect connecting with the resources, the people at school, Bridget highlighted all the different strategies and supporting aspects that can be supported as a student and getting them to help brainstorm with different activities that are involved, the clubs that are going on and getting that fit into their schedule. Okay, thank you. This next one is how are the teachers preparing to, for dealing with kids who are struggling? It's a great, great question. So, we are on one of our first Glenbrook days or Institute days when all staff are back um, for the start of the school year. We've been partnering with Family Services actually, Cody, who's on this webinar is gonna be working with us, has been working with us all summer, that we're talking about um, with all of our staff members, um, a presentation that will be viewed by all um, from a trauma-informed lens. So helping teachers and staff members kind of recognize that We've all gone through a struggle the last few months for sure, um, which we would con con compare to a trauma, um, that we've all suffered a trauma, especially students. They, they've gone through many losses, whether it's loss of activities or friends and the school and the structure. For some, it's more personal than that. It could be a loss of a loved one, 
family member, friend, um, families losing their jobs, income changes. So a, a host of, of things that are, are affecting all of us. So we're going to talk about that um, and try to provide some signs that they should be looking for. And then how can, how can you refer as a teacher that student that you're concerned about to us in student services so we can kind of some kind of wrap our, our hands around that student and try to work with that student and the family to, to help support that individual. So that's a starting point and that's going to be ongoing for, um, for the fall where we're going to have touch point weekly check-ins with all of our teachers um, to try to provide support for them in the classroom because they are on the front lines and they, they see a lot of things um, with their students and, and we're here to support them as well. And they're, they're our best source of referrals for students that really need some extra assistance. And I'll just add to that, um, both of our buildings have problem solving teams in place. So our guidance counselors are connected with social workers, psychologists, and deans, and they meet on a weekly basis, basis proactively to try and identify students that are struggling and to intervene with students and with parents and to provide support to the teachers when they notice a student is struggling. Okay, thank you. Okay, this next one. Um, are there any groups for parents to share and support each other? Well, I'd like to jump in if I can as a CATCH representative. Um, CATCH is a group that um, offers a lot of parent support. We offer coffee talks and collaborate with schools and other agencies for um, programming. So I just encourage you before I turn it over to the other speakers to check out um, our website and you can email us at uh, catchescommunity at gmail.com if you'd like to be added to our email list and hear about upcoming events. And if somebody, if one of the speakers wants to talk about other support groups in the area, that would be great. I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, I don't know necessarily in terms of support groups, but we do have many different parent organizations within the high school. So there is a parents association and they meet on a regular basis and they also plan education events um, and provide a lot of support to other parents and to the building and community. Um, we also have a booster club within athletics and within the band and music program. So definitely different opportunities for parents to get involved and several parent presentations that each building does throughout the school year, not only for college and, and getting acclimated, or I'm sorry, getting prepared for that college application process, but also to help parents navigate the high schools. Great, okay. How can we make sure our kids are getting enough physical activity throughout the day? especially if there will be wellness taking up some of that physical education time. And also for families um, where they can't or aren't, also in families that aren't active. Yeah, I, I might jump on there and anybody else can uh, add, but I think there are social emotional learning curriculum that we're gonna be implementing in the PE classes. Um, it's gonna happen one day a week for six weeks. So the other days um, that the students schedule for PE, they will still have physical activities. So that's, that's uh, in conjunction with physical activities and the social emotional learning. So we're kind of looking at it as a large umbrella of wellness and combining the two. Um, suggestions for how to be active even outside of PE at home. You know, I, th I think one of our presenters talked about family meetings or family time. You know, maybe sometime uh, once a week, maybe during a family meeting, instead of maybe playing a board game or having a conversation and discussion, maybe there's an outdoor activity that you can engage in, maybe some, uh, going for a walk or a bike ride, um, but some type of planned activity that could fall within that family meeting time might be a good thing to do just to stay connected, but also get some physical benefits of the exercise. Just one suggestion to consider. I'd like to just add to that as well of um, two parts, modeling, I heard, what if the family's not very active? Identifying this is a family goal. We're going to start getting active. If you're asking your teen to do something that you are not interested in doing either, it's going to be really hard for them to get on board with it. The other suggestion is to see 
activity, physical activity on a spectrum. I hear a lot of times from teens of, well, I don't want to be physically active because I'm not an athlete. I'm not sporty. Well, that's completely okay. We don't need to be physically active and preparing for a marathon. Going for a walk for five minutes might be the activity that you're ready to try out and then build on from there. Um, you also want to be really mindful, especially with e-learning, working from home or sitting at our desks a lot more. So even getting up and moving to a different room or going up and down the stairs a little bit can be as important as it is playing on a sports team. Great. Okay, my student was very good about his schoolwork in person. He never missed a single deadline. With e-learning, I noticed that he missed homework deadlines. How can we train students to stay on top of their schoolwork during e-learning? So I think that can be challenging for students even during in-person in terms of the organization of it. Um, I think each school is going to be providing different resources and supports to help student try, students try to organize their daily work. Um, I know one of the things we're creating is an online e-learning assignment notebook as a template so that students can use that to record their daily synchronous sessions as well as any assignments and long-term projects that are coming up. I think always reaching out to that support team that I talked about, to the student's guidance counselor, they will have definitely have other strategies and supports that can be put in place to help students who are struggling with, with organization or executive functioning. Thank you. Okay, I have one last question, if that's okay. I know we're coming up on the um, 8.30 hour. Okay, as great as um, touch points from the teachers are, will the school counselors be more involved specifically with the TLS classroom where there is a variety of disabilities and the need for a mental health check is just as important? Right, I think that's a really good question and the answer would be yes. Um, the counselors will be involved with all the students, so including the TLS students. Um, checking in with the, the students um, and we'll, we'll be doing that virtually from the beginning of the school year trying to connect with all the students on, on our caseloads. Um, we're also going to be offering some sessions um, in small groups um, with students. So we're going to try to um, really uh, connect with all students um, through the student services department um, for sure. So TLS students, any special ed students and, and all the, the general ed students uh, within our in our building. Every single student is important to us and we want to make sure that they're connected and feeling supported by all of us. Okay. Thank you. I think that wraps up the Q&A portion. Sounds great. Well, I, just one more time, just want to thank uh, Ketch for, for uh, helping to host this event and Family Services, Youth Services, Compass um, and all our colleagues at GBN and GBS. I think we are so fortunate to live and work and attend schools in Glenview and Northbrook. And we have so much support with our communities. And, and the message hopefully that you can leave here is we're excited that school is starting. We're here to support you and we will help you navigate this year. Um, there will be some positives that are going to come out of this year and there's going to be some struggles. We will support you. So thank you. And Laura, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I, I echo everything Eric just said as well. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Please do not hesitate once the school year starts um, to reach out to us. Your guidance counselor is a great first point person and can definitely point you in the right direction no matter what the need is. Take care and we look forward to seeing you soon. watching. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram, or find us at catchiscommunity.org for updated video content and community programming. Catch is dedicated to making a difference in our community through empowering families to raise resilient and independent youth.